We are live with Charles Lee. It's Nicholas Alexander Karadza and Tomislav Mio Karadza. I don't know if I've ever said my full name like that, have I? Maybe. The Mio part? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. That was supposed to be my middle, my first name. My first <laughs> name was supposed to be Mio. Charles, do you have a middle name? Nope. Charles Lee. Yep. Let's jump into that's it. That's a lot easier than <laughs> Tomislav Yeah, that's a lot Mio. easier. Yeah, what's your name? Charles Lee. What's your name? Tomislav Mio Karadza. <laughs> uh, Charles, let's w walk right into it. So... Before we explain what you're doing here at Rockstar, you were born in China. That's right. Somehow you do not speak Chinese. Uh, Chinese, sorry, Mandarin. That's right. You don't speak Mandarin, or what is the other language? Cantonese. I'm Cantonese. I speak Mandarin, but oh. I just never went to Chinese school. Okay, got it. So yeah. walk us through. Uh, you are born in China. Yeah. Take us through this journey of your life. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, my parents are from Shanghai, China. So it's one of the major cities aside from Beijing. Um, and uh, I was born there. And when I was born, I didn't know who my parents were. All I knew was my parents were very old. And I quickly realized the parents that I thought were pa my parents were actually my grandpa and gra grandma. Because when I was born, my parents flew to Japan to start their journey. And uh, I never really saw them. So, so their journey to leave China? Yeah, they left China. So, yeah, what Japan. do you mean to start their journey, though? Like, that was really For, the start of what? Yeah, so back then, China, I think it was communist, and they just recently opened up, and uh, my parents went to Japan. because You're going to have to stay, keep staying closer to the mic there. Yeah, Japan was in a, uh, in a bubble during that time. Everything was very good, and the salary, what you can make in Japan... Um, in one week was a month's worth of salary income in China. So they went to Japan to have a better life. Yeah. Do you know, I, I'm curious, this is, uh, you, uh, you were too young probably to know, I just don't know if you've spoken to them after the fact. In that scenario though, wasn't, it was the cost of living also, you know, four times higher as well. So even though they were making more money, they were making what they would make in a week, in, uh, what they could make in a, in a month in China, they were making a week in Japan. Were they spending right. that much more as well? Yeah. So the thing about Japan is that you can have a very luxurious life or you can have a very basic, basic life. You can basically live and eat from a convenience store. The convenience store has bread, bento box, um, coffees, juice, everything you need to live. So for them, they worked um, you know, during the day and then they just studied Jap Japanese during the night. And they saved every single lunch that uh, the company provided them. And that was enough for uh, one month's salary in China. And they sent the money back to their parents. And that's how they supported me, all the way from zero to three years old. <laughs> so when did you realize, when did you realize your parents, your grandparents weren't your parents? Right. So every year, um, there were these mysterious couple that came back and gave me some some toys, stuffed toys. And, um, you know, I just remember vividly that these these people were super nice to me. And um, I, I had, they left this smell. It, I think it was my mom's, like, shampoo smell on the pillow that I w really, really liked and I resonated with. And, yeah, it took about three years for me to realize they were actual my parents. And I didn't understand the concept between what's parents and what's a grandparents they're just people that raised me up so when they were working in japan and they were able to send money and provide for you back home in china right. what were they doing in J in china before going to japan okay so back then um i th my father was a musician he played professional violin while my mom was a professional uh ballet ball ballet performer so they were kind of in an art uh, school. Wow. But it was uh, dictated by the government. So they would do performance for different parties uh, that came to China. And then I guess they got some set salary or some set pay for I believe that so. That's where they met. Yeah. But it wasn't enough to satisfy them, and that's why they left, you said, to start their journey in Japan. That's what right. year do you think, what year, when you say start their journey, what year was that that they left? 1988, when I was born. So when they left in 88. That's right. So probably they had you and they realized, oh my gosh, we now have this <laughs> son. We want a better life. And you made your parents go on this journey. <laughs> so they made it in Japan. They teach themselves Japanese because they didn't know Japanese. Yeah. And then you, they went, do you get pulled over to Japan at some point? Yeah, when I was three years old. 
Okay, so at three years old, that's when they took you over. That's right. And where were you living in Japan? Um, it's a city called Osaka. Yeah, do you guys know? I've heard of yeah. it. I've heard of it. Yeah, I don't yeah. know much about Japan. But definitely yeah. heard of it. And it's Osaka. like Manchester version of uh, England. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Why Manchester? Because there's a lot of manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, the people from Osaka thinks Osaka is the capital of Japan, and <laughs> they have a very strong accent that uh, regular Japanese don't understand. Oh, really? Uh, but the people are very, very nice, uh, less business-like, more um, relationship-based. Yeah, lots of parties. Got it. Lots of good food. Yeah, cool. Okay, so you get there at three years old, and where are you living? There in a condo? Right. So um, I, I don't know where my parents lived prior to me arriving in Japan, but once I, ri- I arrived there, they got a very nice condo for us, but it was a rental. And for the next uh, 10 years, we just rented. What were your parents doing in Japan? We know what they were doing in China first. Did we, uh, did yeah. So my dad at that time, when he first got started, he was in a warehouse carrying, uh, restocking for, I think, convenience store. And then my mom worked in a sales position. She worked in a luxury furniture, but Chinese, Chinese luxury. Yeah, like elephant horns and stuff like that. Yeah, I feel like this is just so such a different world to me. It is like I feel <laughs> like this is completely you mean from our upbringing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I just no con. Never been to Japan. Never been to yeah. China. I just can't even fathom this whole world. There's just a lot of similarities between so many immigrant stories that the, I've heard. The immigrant whether it's people story, coming to, yes. to Toronto. What you know? It, it's just there's so many parallels yeah. that you can draw. It's around the work ethic and 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 the I don't want to necessarily say sacrifice, but the delayed gratification. That's right. right. The, the fact that they were willing to sacrifice something early on with, you know, the meals and just living out of whatever the convenience store could provide yeah. to be able to get something down the road further. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, that was almost th- the norm and expected <laughs> back then. Whereas now this, this concept of delayed gratification, everyone wants everything immediately, immediate, yeah, everything. Yeah. And, and it's just, there's, there's a, a big distinction there that I think I see because they, they, str- you know, they, they strived and they, they ended up getting so much, but. Anyway, sorry, I don't want to interrupt the story. So wh- wh- where yeah. where do you guys go from here? So you guys are there. You've been renting for, for 10 years. How does this journey then kind of move from Japan? Maybe there's something else in, in the middle, but or yeah. move on or move from Japan to Canada? Uh, j- just just back up to the, the point of great uh, delayed gratification. My parents, when they first went to Japan, they had absolutely nothing. All they had was one bag of rice and a $100 equivalent of Canadian. And that's how they started. And they didn't know the language. They didn't have any connections whatsoever. Um, but my dad had a skill. And the skill was he, l- he was a professional violinist. And then basically, he went to interview at one of the most prestigious university um, in Kyoto. And then he got in full scholarship. And he lived in the professor's home. And the professor provided everything for him. So that was when he first went there. So when you were still in China, that's, he was going to school there that's and right. working, I would imagine. So he was working uh, at a warehouse. And then uh, when he got off work, he was doing violin. And he thought, you know what, I need a master's degree or some sort of education that's recognized in Japan. So he just went to the professor's place blindly, just played. I don't know. He did whatever he had to do to earn the full scholarship and live in the uh, professor's home. Holy moly. So he basically took him in. Yeah. So basically your dad's other skill was to bust his ass to make sure that he just kind of had to you know, do what he had to do. That's all he knew. Violin. All wow. his life. Yeah. So, so your mom was a dancer. He was a viol- violinist. Right. Oh. I think during that time, my mom did some part-time job um, teaching ballet. But uh, quickly, she went to the high-end furniture store and she did very, very well there while supporting my dad through the university. Even though he was all paid for, but still, someone had to make the living and pay the sure. The you rent. still need food and That's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what next? You guys buy a place in Japan? No, 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 no. Okay, okay. So Japan is almost exact opposite from North America, in my opinion. Remember, um, you often say that you want to live in a world where the savings gets rewarded. Oh, here right? we go. Now we're gonna have to go <laughs> into that. <laughs> So in Japan, it's, it's exactly like that. People save because there's almost 
no inflation at that time. And the uh, house value is like a car. It's a depreciating asset. So people had one car, one house, one job for their life. And that's a very, very s- small life. Wow. So the houses were not going up in value. The Japanese yen was going up in value. Um, no, the Japanese yen relative to the houses was going up in value. Their savings was not losing value. That's right. Real estate over time during that era, so from 1991 to 19 to year 2000 or whatever, that nine or 10 year period. Even property, now. Even now property prices. That's what we kind of refer to from North America, the lost decade in Japan. Right, so property prices were not going up. Not going up, still not going up. So they, property prices down, are still they, flat. But they came down in the flat. Uh, they just lose value, like almost half of the value by the time it's 20 years. Really? Th- there's still a sense of, you know, if you're not buying anything brand new, it's, it's used. How can you sell a used product more than a brand new product? That's the Same perception. Thing with so if you, buy a, if you buy a condo in Osaka, yeah. For I don't know what the price would be in Canadian dollars, but let's just say you know one million dollars. That's right. After twenty years, yeah. I can't resell that for a million dollars. No. What am I reselling that At for? At most, this is so confused. This is so how much? At most, two hundred thousand. That's why they they don't move. I know my friends that I grew up with. If I were to go back today to Osaka, the city, their parents would still be living in the same house that we were in. Um, and maybe my friends are still living with the parents. <laughs> but the, your friends are still living with their parents not because they can't afford a place then. They, they can't afford as well. Um, there's just not, there's no concept of ownership because it, Because it things worthless. go down in value. Yeah. So the majority of people then have Rent. no... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And if you were to decide to buy a home, usually it's a... you. It's a teardown. So you buy a lot, they tear down, they do a custom build, and you live there for generations. Huh. Okay, that's stuck what stuck in a negative equity. <laughs> stuck that's in negative equity because the property goes down in value. So you build something and it's costing you so much money to build, X number of dollars to build, and then over time it just loses value. Right. So you owe more than this is what like it's this worth. is the, my <laughs> brain can't even comprehend uh, comprehend this. So at this point then the, your savings go up in value. So everybody there is motivated to save money and not spend. And you have a demographic base, from what I understand in Japan, uh, um, over the last 20 or 30 years, the demographics are an aging population. That's so right. You, so you have people spending less, so the economy is shrinking from less spending, and there's this environment, and I don't know if that's because people are spending less, but there's this environment where value property values are going down yeah. So there's no real motivation to stick your money as a place to save it in a property because why would you do that? It goes down in value. That's right. This is like this and, is, and yeah. yeah, I'm like I'm trying to look up yeah. the Japanese <laughs> pri- real estate <laughs> price index because I gotta want yeah, to, I gotta yeah. see this. Yeah, go. And uh, immigration is not like Canada, right? They're okay. We are a perfect example. We were there for I was there for ten years. My parents were there probably twelve, thirteen years. We never got a uh, Japanese citizenship. And we never owned anything. Wow. All we did, we, is we saved for that 10 plus years. And we saved, I think, about 100,000 equivalent of USD. That's how we got started in Canada. Okay, so before we get there, Nick, yeah, what I just have to get <laughs> through my mind is that if the Japanese yen relative to the US dollar, like the cross rate to the US dollar or Canadian dollar, I wonder how the Japanese yen has done now I have to go look at this because <laughs> I need to know what happened to the Japanese yen relative to the Canadian dollar over that period. Okay. Like, did the Japanese yen appreciate? Like, is this a local thing that was happening? Or did this extend to other countries where the Japanese yen went up in value against the Canadian dollar? I kind of think it probably did. Anyway, yeah. um, I, so, yeah. so you save up this money, 100000 US dollars. And then why did you come to Canada and not the US? So, um, in Japan, if you ever watch local news, almost every hour you get an alert. And the alert is like, Samsung province, earthquake. Samsung province, earthquake. 
And Japan, as you know, it has a lot of natural disasters. And we experienced the biggest earthquake in 1995, where the, ha- the highway, just imagine like a garden ra- expressway, the whole thing broke down. And we experienced that. I think I remember oh, wow. that. Wow, Charles yeah. is showing us a yeah. picture that looks like the Gardner Expressway, but tipped over on its side, the whole thing. Yeah. So this was the highway that connected Kobe. Maybe you know Kobe from the Kobe Beats. <laughs> oh, Kobe wow. to okay. Osaka. Yeah. The whole, the whole, yeah, the two city was like destroyed. And I remember it was three days after my birthday. For the entire week, we knew it was coming. We didn't know when. So we slept under the uh, dining table. Just waiting for that moment. And then it came on 1995, I think January 17th, 5 a.m. Entire thing, shelf, everything. Like it was like I was uh, taking drugs or something. <laughs> everything was delusional. How'd you know it was coming? Because the news told us it's so coming. Oh. They detected there some, some tremors. Yeah, they, yeah, they have the uh, sensitivity yeah. thing. Yeah. Holy cow. We knew it was coming this week. We didn't know when, and we might die. So just. Pack your stuff and sleep under the table. Because <laughs> uh, we didn't have basements. Nobody had basements. Holy smokes. <laughs> You're like introducing me to an entire new world that I had no comprehension of it at all. Here's okay. the Japanese. This, is, I, I believe, is the price index, the real estate price index. So you can see how it spiked. Yeah, got and it. And then it came back down. When's that spike on that chart? And then it's like leveled off. When I, when I zoom in, it's hard. This chart's from um, 2000, this is from 84 to 2018, so that spike mm-hmm. is relatively early, early 90s or something. That uh, it's When I zoom in, it gets all blurry. Okay, so then everything came down, and it, has, it looks like it hasn't gone and up. Then it's leveled off for a time period, which we know, the stagflation yeah. that we've seen yeah. in Japan, they've been trying to get inflation for forever. Yeah. forever. Because More everybody just now. saves their money, and it's in the mentality. Everybody's just stuffing money under the mattress. Yeah, so the velocity of money's no got to be just tiny, like no, non-existent there, I would imagine. Speaking of uh, mentality, that's the other thing that um, had a strong impact on me when I was growing up in Japan. Um, and to this day, it influenced my mindset and my confidence. Uh, for example, there is this word in Japanese. It's called motainai. Motainai means feeling of regret for wasting things. So it's a very scarcity mindset, right? For example, when you have rice, we cannot even waste one bit of rice. Don't throw anything away. When you go shopping, you keep all the bags. <laughs> and keep and improvise. Keep and improvise. Never throw anything away. It's, uh, it goes very deep in roots of how Japanese think. Another thing will be shogana, shoganai, which means it can't be helped. So when there is a natural disaster or something terrible that happens, um, it's a way for them to get over it fast. Shogunai. <laughs> wow. So, so you're bringing those points up because you think that way of thinking has, has ingrained in you yeah. and it's affected your confidence in some way? Yeah. The biggest one, biggest one even till now is how can I have minimum impact on others when I take action? And that goes with anything. For example, if we were in Japan today, I would never be able to speak up in front of you guys because you guys are my seniors and you, uh, I have all the respect. So unless you're giving me the permission to speak, I will never be able to speak up. And that goes throughout the, the company, the society, even among friends. And we have an entire different language for seniors, even if it's one year old, older than me. It, does that exist in in? In North America, mm-hmm. it doesn't exist. There's a certain respect I find in Europe for seniors, a certain amount. But here, because there's a certain amount of wisdom that's passed on, like that person knows how to take care of the vineyards. So they're going to teach you how to take care of the vineyards. And there's a certain respect that comes from that because they've been doing it. They have the magical way to water the, the vines and take care of everything. <laughs> they know when to harvest. And, and that's not written down anywhere. So it's passed on. So there's just like a natural respect right. that comes from the people who know. Yeah. We're here in North America. I feel it's like zero. Yeah. Like when I call you, I call, hey, Nick. Hey, hey Nick. Hey, Tom, right? I, I can never do that in Japanese. There's a whole new language for calling your superior. Wow. So things like that, it's really hard to break, uh, break up. Yeah. Charles, <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. 
So, okay, so then you get here to Canada in 2001, 2002, 2000, no, 2004-ish. We came to Canada in 2000. In 2000. in 2000, you decided Canada. It sounded like we got off p- a path there, but we got you came to Canada because of all these earthquakes in Japan, and so you think Canada is super safe. Yes. Also, we have some family members here, and we just want to have a better, bigger life, a life that. <laughs> okay, let's go back to another mentality thing too. In Japan, you don't speak up of your worries and your. <coughs> your emotions you are always suppressing your emotions you're always internalizing taking in more and more stress you don't you, there's no outlet and is that why i always hear the suicide rate in japan is always really high yeah so if you visit japan it's a beautiful beautiful place but from that's from outside looking in if you actually live there it's it's a totally different Okay, country. so the, the context that you're having around this, your perception of this, when you're living in the in the fish bubble, mm-hmm. you don't see it. You don't see did it. you realize this when you came to Canada, or is, did this come from your parents this because they were born they were born in China and China right. was different? That's right. Really? Yeah. So Japan, in some ways, was more oppressive than a communist China. In terms of it's social it, it's culture it, it i guess the, the the you know the social rules between I think it was people. a culture shock from what they were used to maybe yeah i'm not sure yeah in terms of like freedom of speech and stuff like that for sure japan for it's like an unwritten rule so when you sorry just to backtrack for sure so you're saying japan you felt there was less freedom of speech than in china according to my parents yeah. wow yeah okay so, so they had that context from China. So then they realized that you guys want to get out of Japan and you come to Canada in 2000, 2000. and you get to where Vancouver, Vancouver. Yeah, that's right. And specifically we went to Richmond in Vancouver and Richmond in Vancouver to me was like a Chinatown. <laughs> so I came to Canada to learn English. Instead, I go to high uh, elementary school uh, on the hallway. All I hear is Chinese. <laughs> got it that was so weird <laughs> and at this point you didn't even speak chinese that's right so the so way you learned chinese in canada yeah so the way <laughs> i grew up Nick, was you can't even make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. every time my parents talk to me they will speak to me in mandarin and then i will respond in japanese that's how we communicated and that created some burden between us because you know our communication fluidity as well as the depth of the conversation always has some issues when i came to canada i learned chinese i learned how to speak chinese um and that was mandarin that was mandarin yeah it was yeah so so you learned to speak mandarin and then the the in richmond bc in richmond bc and that also enriched the quality of communication between you and your parents Mm, just basic level so that's when I felt like I had some sort of identity crisis because I thought like a Japanese. I thought I was Japanese, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't. <laughs> and uh, I spoke this broken Chinese, um, try to make friends with the Chinese people in Richmond. And they were like, who, who are you? That's right. And they had this like accent, right? They couldn't even figure out what accent it was. <laughs> it was a mixture of Japanese, Chinese. Holy smokes. Yeah. <laughs> and how was your English? Oh, my English was zero. I went to get a test from ESL. I think yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the governing body. I think I was level one. All I could say was ice cream. Oh, good. Or good choice. That's a good o- word to learn. Orange. Orange. Yeah. Holy <laughs> smokes, Charles. I couldn't say from A to Z because in Japan, you learn English in your high school. I never, I just graduated my elementary, so I never learned English. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then your parents, okay, so before we get into your story here in Canada, your parents are starting over again. That's right. What are they doing here in Canada? That's right. Same thing. So in Japan, before we left, we had a substantial um, music school business. So my dad, after the university, the professor told my dad, um, if you don't start applying your knowledge to make some sort of income, you're going to lose your wife. So my, my mom, uh, thankfully, she is very business-oriented mindset. So she did all the marketing. She, she basically used my dad's ability to the, to the utmost. 
right? She extracted everything that he could offer, and we created this uh, music school in Japan. And we had performances to the mayor of the city. Um, it was pretty successful um, business-wise and money-wise. So when we came to Vancouver, Richmond, we did the same thing. But except this time, we had the $100,000 in USD. At that time, uh, we were lucky. I think USD to Canadian was uh, 1 to 1.4. So it was very good exchange rate. And my mom, for some odd reason, she said, let's buy a house. Why? Because we need somewhere, like a living room, to teach the music. And instead of renting a commercial space, that's how we're going to do it. It's funny that she thought that considering you never bought it. They never, you guys they didn't never own a home before they that. To, to, you know, you know, to think that way. Maybe because here you had the opportunity to. And, you know, I, I don't know what, how, what the, di- the differences will be to buy here versus there. I asked my mom the question all the time. And it's not like, you know, we lived in a small place. When we first came to Richmond, we rented a, a townhome. And that townhome was probably bigger than most of the detached home in Japan. So for, uh, for her to think this is not big enough, we got to have our own land to start our own business before we even have any clients was just nuts. And that was the last $100,000 we had. So anyways, uh, fast forward, 35% down she put um, on her first home and um, she, she began marketing. And we didn't need any English to begin marketing because of the Chinatown. Because you were, you were <laughs> in Chinatown in Canada. In Canada. It was strange. I couldn't figure out if this was China or we're close to U.S. Wow. <laughs> I went, it, so, it sounds like your parents might have had an easier time in Canada because they were surrounded by Chinese. Yeah, that's right. Wow. That's right. But they didn't know that. Okay, so then they start that. You start going to this high school where you can speak a little bit of Mandarin, yep. basically no English, and yep. Japanese is not useful to you anymore because right. there's no one speaking Japanese. That's right. Um, or very few if there are. That's right. Okay, so then what happens? You, this evolves and you end up in Toronto? When do you get to Toronto? Um, okay, before we get to Toronto, <laughs> okay. sorry, there's something I got to bring out. Um while w- once we settled down with the business, uh, it was 2000, I think, two. My mom, what happened was the kids would teach, you know, learn the English from my dad in the living room, right? And the parents were, while they were waiting, they were sitting in the back, communicating and talking to my mom. And oftentimes, guess what they were talking about? Real estate. So two years in, there was um, a Taiwanese uh, a Taiwanese family who told my mom that you should get into real estate investing. To us, it was a foreign concept. Never mind owning a property, like investing. Like a, what? You mean having a second house <laughs> <laughs> and rent it out? So there was an opportunity in a downtown Yale Town. I don't know if you know Vancouver. Yale Town is kind of this... Uh, um, there's a lot of bars. It's near the water. You can bike to the English Bay. Oh, got it. So I think I do know the area. I think I've been there Yale once. And I didn't know that's where it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So back then, Yale Town was a little bit sketchy in 2002. But we had an opportunity to purchase a pre-construction there for $190,000, one bedroom. And just for 20000 20, deposit was required by the water, right? So my mom listened, she took action, she paid the 20,000 deposit, and she gets cold feet because it didn't come with a parking. So her, her, <laughs> she couldn't, yeah, her only objection was, you know what, without parking, no one's gonna rent. And she told out to herself and, and her parents, yeah, her, her husband, and then she one day told me, Charles, um, I need you uh, because we're going to go get our deposit back. <laughs> and I need someone who can speak English to come with me and, and a little bit, you know, muscle <laughs> in case they won't return the deposit. This is, your, <laughs> this is the first real estate deal no, you're like involved it. in. Like oh, it. my God. You're the muscle. Yeah. Awesome. I, I don't remember which uh, developer it was. Maybe Daniel's. I, I don't know. One of the major ones. So I remember making the trip to the representation center 
and talking to the sales rep that we need our deposit back. And they didn't even hesitate. They're like, sure, we have like lots of people lining up. Are you sure you want are you sure you want to back out of this? And we're like, yes, yes, certainly. No. No parking, no deal. <laughs> yeah. And that was probably the biggest regret. So well, far. It's easy to say that looking something. back, but you know, at the time, it was the right decision, right? At that time, it was the only twenty thousand I think we had, mm-hmm. and I don't know, one ninety. Maybe it's a lot for one bedroom without parking, but yeah, to this day, we bring that up on our family. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. What What is it worth today, if you had to guess? Six fifty. Yeah, at least. got it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, we see that on a regular basis. Yeah. People, especially new investors, first investment property after the deal is signed, they're all excited and stuff. A couple of days later, there's a little bit of you know, there's there's Fires the emo- yeah, the emotions start kicking in. Like, what about this? What about that? Yeah. You know, they're replaying everything in their head, and uh, right. yeah, it's it. I think it's fairly common. Yeah, so that happened, and then it wasn't six years later that uh, we took on another opportunity. So yeah. six years later, so, so six full years. six years till you circled back and then f- your parents ended up buying an investment property. That's right. So that one, it's their first investment property. Yes, but it's also mine because the, the concept was, so now we're in 2008. The concept was, you know, I'm in university. By the time I finish the four years. Or Where were you in university? Or in BC or here? No, no, I okay, yeah. So I came to Toronto for U of T. So for the U of T, so that's yeah. that's how you ended up coming over here, and that that's was right. in two thousand and eight or just before six, the six, six and then eight, you were here yeah. for a little bit, and that's why you guys decided to buy the condo at that's that right. time. Um, well, I was forced to. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so my mom was like, <laughs> after six years, uh, there's a great uh, opportunity coming up in Richmond. Um, the Vancouver at that time they were proposing to come up with SkyTrain all the way from Richmond to the downtown core. Um, so all those SkyTrain station was about to be built. And we knew this particular condo was right bef- in front of it. And it was a kind of a community. Yeah, it had a community center and also a college all embedded. So it was like a no brainer. So my parents said, okay, um, we're not gonna back out this time. We're going to pay the deposit and you're going to close on it once you graduate. And that's how we got in. Interesting. Yeah. It's, and that, so, so hold on, just so I'm clear, that was in Richmond though. That, that was in Richmond. So, there, so you were here, then they're like, come back here, come back home to yeah. close on that property. That's right. <laughs> how, I still don't understand how you're in Toronto. Did you, then you came school. back to Toronto? No, <laughs> I no. did Yeah, after school, he went back home. He went to BC. <laughs> I, so, did, I so didn't go did back. I never went back. <laughs> well, you didn't go back to close on the condo. Oh, yes. I closed on the condo, but I never going back to live. To live there. Yeah. Okay, so you just went to care of that and lived there. Ah, yeah. gotcha, I gotcha. Okay. And so you rent that one out there? That's right. That's wow. Right. Where do your parents live right now? Uh, now, so my brother also got into U of T as well. So f- with that, there's a, bro- being, there's a brother? There's a younger yeah. brother. Okay, got it. Uh, that's another... Uh, <laughs> Where um, was he born? He I'm was sure. born in Osaka, Japan. Okay, okay, got That's it. right. <laughs> but he never went to Japanese school. So he's kind of like me. Like, you know, he grew <laughs> up in Canada, but he can understand Japanese, but he never went to school there. He's your like, he's your parents broken. like to have children, but leave the leave country <laughs> before, they before can the that. kids can go to school That's in right. that country. It's That's quite right. the strategy. I like it. Um, okay, so you're here in Toronto. You finished school. What did you finish school for? What was the degree? Uh, I did mechanical engineering. Okay, so yeah. you did something s- really smart, mechanical engineering. And then do you go to work as a mechanical engineer here, here in Toronto? Right. So on my fourth year, I already got offer from Mitsubishi Aerospace. Um, they were just starting up here in Mississauga uh, for Bombardier Business Jet. So we did the final assembly for the wing and the fuselage just over here in Mississauga. And that's the company I got in. So while me, while me and my friends yeah. and Nick are growing up in Mississauga, having fights at Burger King on Friday nights, Charles is making this path and journey. We're yeah. older. We're yeah. older. But pa- Charles is making this educated He's journey. He's building jets. Building jets. And we're just running around like a group of 
And I didn't even know there was an aerospace <laughs> thing in Mississauga. Right. Wow. So Charles' yeah. journey to Mississauga is very different than our journey yeah. to Mississauga. I was um, born in Mississauga, <laughs> and then I stayed in Mississauga <laughs> and grew up no, in you Mississauga. you were born in Toronto. You were born in Toronto. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. you don't even know that part. <laughs> <laughs> I just confirmed this the other day because I didn't know that part either. I'm like, Nick was born in Mississauga. And it was our mom was like, no, he was born in Toronto. Really? So <laughs> maybe I have it mixed up. We'll verify. No, I think we'll, you're right. We'll verify it again. But... Um, Okay, so you, you're doing this job, and then and then you get the real estate. No, where, where do you meet us and Rockstar or real estate? How does real estate start entering the picture again here? Well, you have, well, hold on. By this point, you have, um, so you have that condo, which was yours through your parents kind of thing, yeah. and then you come back here, and yeah, so you, real estate's yeah. entered, but not here yet. Yeah. So where does it enter, like, to Tom's point, here? Um, after that, I got a, so I worked in Mitsubishi, I think two years, then I got a condo in downtown Toronto. Okay, who's man? Hold on, who's managing the condo in BC? Your parents were managing it. We just found out it's being used as an Airbnb. <laughs> you mean right now? Yeah. No, oh, okay. So I was asking back then, but we back were then, so hands free, so we rented out um, to various, you know, students. And okay, so you guys, them. you guys were actively managing That's it. Right. On There's no basis. property manager, no. Okay, and then now you guys have been so hands off with it uh, that it. we found out. It's being used as an Airbnb. So now we're going through the eviction process, and that's another headache that we're going through. But it's sweet and bitter. Yeah, the price has almost tripled. Sometimes that's not a bad, bad. Like being used as an Airbnb has the stigma right. around it, which you, maybe yours is, is, is not in good shape. But no, no, it was. Airbnb. Yeah. So then what? what's the problem? Like why was that seem you made that seem like such a negative? Right. What's the problem with that be such a negative? If you're earning your the income, condo board, but like is it maybe? And that I was gonna ask. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, we find out quickly that if we told the condo board, we'll get the owner will get charged like one seventy a day until okay. this gets resolved. Also, we saw some scratches on the floor, but overall, because there's a um, frequent cleaning that's happening, it's in a decent shape. But we can smell like cigarettes or who knows what else they're smoking. Okay. Right. It's just uh, I can tell you what else they're smoking. <laughs> but, but I mean, yeah. yeah, I think we're on the same page. Yeah, it's uh, we don't want to go through that. So okay, yes, gotcha. maybe in hindsight we could have worked out a deal with the guy who's operating it because he looks like he's operating multiple units in the building, um, but we didn't want to have that headache. And okay. I think it's I don't know what it is in BC, but I'd imagine it's pretty clear cut. If someone's using it and it's against the purposes that for the zoning allows in that area, mm-hmm. then it should be a pretty clear cut process to get them evicted. You just so have to we're prove learning that, about right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're here in Toronto, you got this good job. Yeah. It's paying you well, I'd imagine. It was paying me okay to okay, get it's started. It's yeah. paying you okay to get started. And then what, you just get the real estate bug again? No, no, no. No, no. Yeah, if you see the amount of the designer real estate, stuff that he wears, it's only yeah. paying him okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so this is what happened before uh, my parents came over to Toronto. My mom got cancer, so I think it was the first year I s- I went to university. That winter, I came back, we went to the hospital, we did the the colonoscopy, and then we find out on the spot she has colon cancer, and that was a turning point. Because from then on, um, my our business, the music school business, just went flat down. And at the same time, they still had to support me and my cost of living here in Toronto, right? So what they did was they rented out part of their home. And this was a, a fluke as well. So we had a three garage, you know, two story, like a big home, right? And part of it was severed by the previous owner. Uh, I think it used to be a theater room, but it had a, it was a perfect configuration. Uh, and it had a kitchen, two baths, and no, kitchen, two bedroom, and one bath. And it's got its own separate entrance as well. Not basement, to the side of the home. Almost like a, a addition to a garage. So we started renting that out. And... It wasn't enough, and my mom did a homestay, which is kind of like a you rent to a student, but you take care of their meals as well. That's how she supported, and line of credit. Yeah, that's a big one. So by that time, we went through probably three houses. Every two, three years, we would flip and up, update. Yeah, and uh, we had a substantial equity, so we just lived off on those income as well as line of credit. And that's how we survived. 
until my mom finished her chemo. Wow. Yeah. So that was a aha and, moment. And that that holy the, smokes! The, like real estate thing is real. The yeah. chemo went okay. Your mom's yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. So during that time, I think she had another buddy who had the same uh, cancer. That person didn't survive, but my mom did. Wow. Oh, so. Okay, so it's ingrained in you now <laughs> that real estate has a benefit because it can produce income if you need it. If you needed it. And you, it sounds like you had a line of credit, so you were also tapping into some of the appreciation gains because unlike Japan, British Columbia real yeah. estate goes up in value compared to the Canadian dollar. That's right. And you were able to benefit that way you as know, well. We, we've heard that type of thing. Like it, It's not very uncommon that, that people don't realize the value of having an a asset base like real estate or pre other things until something dramatic happens in their life and they you know and then all of a sudden some sort of income stream dries up yep. and there's these other income streams that they were just using as you know just kind of almost not thinking about yep. they they realize they're like holy cow these have been far these are now far more valuable to me yep. than you know that they put them in place early because then if you you don't realize when you need them until it's it's almost too late right and it, it's not it's it's We've heard that a number of times, especially with health issues, when people have had health issues and the, the difference is made, not even necessarily allowing them to, um, to, to get any procedures or something that they need, but just giving them the peace of mind so that they can take the time off work and not have to stress about things and, and give themselves the chance to recover that they need. Yeah, pure accidental. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, like, we didn't know what line of credit was. The bank wanted to give us more line of credit. We were like, we don't, we don't need all these debt. But so you yeah, take, it was you take very this, useful. You take this knowledge now. Real estate's ingrained in you, <laughs> and this is why you get into real estate here in the Toronto area. No, no, no. Still, at that time, I was still fluffy. I, I knew line of credit, but I didn't know the yeah. I like I didn't study real estate investing. Yeah. So how long were you in your job in this mechanical engineering role before right. you started to get frustrated and think you needed to do something else? That's right. So at this job, I got two promotions. Uh, I went from a, a regular engineer to a senior engineer, and I, I went to a project manager, and in the end, managing a huge uh, supply chain side of things. And every time I got a promotion, I feel like my life didn't get ahead, and I didn't save more but instead I got more work. And I became extremely, extremely frustrated uh, because, um, because I spoke Japanese, I have to listen to what the, the mother company is telling me to do, as well as trying to make our on-site management, like the local management happy. So I was being sandwiched from both sides. You're the classic middle manager, <laughs> Charles. And they just I forgot you spoke Japanese, yeah. so that helped you in this role. I don't know if it helped or it was a curse because I was working almost day and night. There was no off for me because when I got off work, Japan woke up, right? So yeah, it was a constant struggle. And just to put it in perspective, I was in charge of turning off all the suppliers in Japan that makes up these wings and fuselage parts. and source it off to a local supplier here or in Europe to begin making the parts. So fade out and fade in. What was the business decision behind that? Why were they, why were they? Cash flow. Cash flow, so just, just cost, they wanted cheaper. Cash flow as well as, uh, as soon as the assembly package becomes North American uh, duty, then it makes sense for the parts to be made because they don't well. pay tax on the parts coming right. into it. Yeah. So I did the wings first and then did the fuselage it, it, and all the assembly, everything, a final assembly to the Bombardier, everything was done here. And the next thing was the parts. Is it just me? But when you hear that they're, you know, they're like, ah, oh, cost saving measures. So we have to find new suppliers and they're building planes that you fly in. Is it just me or is that you just don't like hearing that? I'd rather, you know, them just worry yeah. about getting the best damn parts they could for the plane. Yeah. <laughs> So you get, you get, yeah, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you get, you, you're getting crushed in this role. Crushed. Yeah. And then, then you just have a breaking point. Like what's the breaking point here? Yeah. So the breaking point is I, so I could, I feel like I couldn't get ahead. I couldn't breathe and I couldn't talk anything about investing or 
trying to start a side hustle with these guys because it was seen as a betrayal, right? Um, and anytime I would mention that, the Japanese management will feel like, oh, you have time, you have the mental time to, to wow. read self-help books, you have the mental time to, to start a side hustle, oh, we better give you more jobs. You're not working enough. Yeah. Wow. Not working enough. Mm -hmm. So that's when I find out, okay, this, this is not it for me. And I also I saw my directors and how they started working earlier and earlier and earlier. So now imagine um, today, those directors are begin work 5 a.m. So what they have to wake up at 3.30. When I started, we started work at 8.30. Until what, when was your typical day? Uh, 8.30 to 4, around there. Okay, so yeah. a nor it was a normal, normal day, yeah, yeah. But as things got more and more uh, difficult for North American assembly, and we got more and more job here to do, it became, yeah, earlier, earlier shift, and people were working over and longer and over time. It's just, uh, it was getting pretty hard. Hmm. So then, that, and then so that you finally, and then you made the jump. So 2000, no, 2017, real estate market was pretty good, right? Same thing. What my mom does, the kids learning <laughs> music and my mom talking real estate. Just 2017 alone, she was able to refer so many real estate deal business to other realtors that she made a pretty good decent side pocket was she still investing during this time or i'm guessing maybe because the health issues that the, you know it changed no. the finances so so you still had the one condo but were you or the family continuing to invest and acquire properties or no, no. okay no but uh, okay. she was making you know pocket yeah. chain through deals yeah yeah and through referrals so that's when she said you know what um this could be a real thing uh we want to keep it within the family you the oldest son you're gonna go get a real estate license but uh, to my heart, I was always an investor, right? So I was thinking about buying uh, another one and another one. And during that time, I dove into um, podcast and audiobooks because I didn't have time when I got back home. I didn't have time when I was at work. So the only time I had was me stuck in traffic. And I started listening to audiobooks. I started listening to Gary Vee. And then I started listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it just felt like, you know, what, there's another world outside of this nine to five. And maybe, maybe if I just got to know the, the right person, I can get out. And uh, I listened to podcasts. Uh, the first podcast was very good. And then the second podcast I listened to was um, Erwin Zito's. And yeah, that year, um, so during this time, I was still working 9 to 5, and the company sent me to Japan uh, for long-term duty. I was in Japan six months, four months at that time, but I was studying real estate, real estate license. <laughs> so I did my five courses. It took me 12 months, and after that, I reached out to Irwin's team, and um, Irwin wouldn't talk to me. So it was James Meggs who called me back. <laughs> yeah, that's how it began. Wow. Uh, officially learning about real estate investing and learning about how to become a, a real estate trade person. How many people have changed wow. their lives yeah. by listening to podcasts and traffic? So yeah. many. He said Rich Dad Poor Dad too. How many people yeah. have, oh have like gosh. got a different line of thinking yeah. from that book? Yeah. 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 Right. So many people. It just it takes such a it takes a topic that is not covered and breaks it down into a very a very plain English in a parable format. I, well, I'm saying parable. I don't know. If, yeah, there's. I know there's a big debate whether it's true or not, right? But you know, a, just a, a, par a story version of it yeah. that you can just kind of relate to and, and understand. That's right. The four quadrants were were mind blowing. Um, before that, nobody talked to me about asset reliability. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about self employment in the business, and nobody talks about the difference between income and wealth. That's something I learned throughout. You know, in this journey as well. Right, like, like a typical person would think, oh, I want to get rich. I want to, I want to make more money. Yeah, so you make two hundred thousand dollars a year. That, yeah, but um, you, you have no wealth. So, so you speak to James. You have your real estate license at this point. Um, I think I was almost there. Yeah, I think okay. I was. I had two more courses, and I was almost 
ready to get licensed, I called up James. Oh, James reached out to me. Because okay, I this is for context Irwin. for anyone listening who doesn't know James. James works with Irwin. They're both part of uh, the Rockstar brokerage. So that's kind of where Charles enters this whole world here at Rockstar. Yeah. Um, James calls you back, yep. but you're still working. So I'm, I'm, very, working. I'm very interested in the moment that you decide to quit. So how does, yeah. it, how does that go down? Like, what, what's the process to, to that? From the moment you're talking to James, how long after until you're quitting your job? I never did. That's the truth. The truth was that I was on the team for two and, and a bit years. And throughout time, they taught me everything. The strategy, how to become a realtor, how to become an investor. Okay, so sorry, you project. mean working with James? Working with James okay. and the team. Got right? it, got it, okay. Um, getting me up to speed. But I never had the courage to quit. And I made myself a plan how to quit. I made a master schedule of how I'm going to refinance the, the property. The engineer in you yeah. was coming out. Yeah, yeah. I have so many case A, case B, case C. Um, and you know what? I, I couldn't pull the trigger. And Erwin um, told me to hire his coach at that time as well. So while I joined the team, I think because Erwin doesn't have time to teach me, James also was busy with his business. So he told me just join Rockstar Inner Circle, which was mind blowing. That's where I learned almost everything in terms of investments and also business starting. That's how I get to know you guys. And at the same time, I hired Irwin's coach. Yeah, Miriam Gillespie. So she was there. Um, she, was, she did one-on-one -on -one with me for about a year and a half. And that was a big one too because her cost was not cheap. And for me, my thinking was, how can I quit my job when I'm taking on more debt or, or cost? I shouldn't say cost, investment. Investment yeah. in yourself. But in yeah, myself. another. I see what you're saying. Another expense so is in your life. Another expense. Yeah, it was not cheap. But I did it because I thought, you know, I don't know what I don't know, but I have the motivation and I think I can make it work right? If, as long as I'm earning. So let's see how it goes. So that's how it began. Uh, the team, the Rockstar Inner Circle. Why? why? And this coach. is going to sound like a self-serving question because, you know, we run Rockstar, the Rockstar Inner Circle. But why was that? Mind, you said mind-blowing. Why was it mind-blowing? Because it was the only opportunity I can come in physically to a class and engage with people that are in the same shoes or or other investor who are in the middle of a project and we're learning a specific strategy uh, in a classroom setting. So, so you had found your people? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it was probably the most formal education I received in terms of real estate investment because before that it was just podcast and podcast, even though it's addictive, no matter how many times I listen to it, the, the, the topic will change and I feel like you can never get in deep with one particular strategy. But here at Rockstar, you have a coach who's teaching you the strategy. You can ask them. You have direct access with them for an hour and a half or two hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, that opened up everything. Sometimes that gave you more confidence. Too. That's interesting to hear because sometimes I think maybe we've been doing this so long we just kind of like discount it because no. it's it's kind of like, yeah, of course, this is the way you do a student rental. Here it is. Like yeah. you can blindfold yeah, Nick you and myself. Yeah, yeah. At this point, we feel like you could blindfold us. Just tell us what city we're in. I can touch a brick wall, ask you a couple of questions, and we'll yeah. say buy or don't buy. <laughs> but but I understand. I, I need to be reminded sometimes that if you're not in it no. all the time, it's, it's very eye-opening. It's new to you like yeah. anything else. Like anything, anything, yeah. For a regular person who maybe have you know one or two regular realtors in their sphere of influence it's very difficult to get that type of information market rent um the arvs uh, things to watch out for lessons learned like these are the things you 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 don't find those people mm -hmm. in the general Got public it. so then you di so then okay so this all you hired the coach join rock center circle and then you don't, you, you still have this job. So still yeah, the job. so what happens? This is like, this is like a suspense drama at this point. A thriller, sorry, a thriller. Yeah. What happens? So I was doing showings, uh, weekends and uh, evenings, right? Um, I was trying to do everything. I was going to Kitchener, 
I was going to Welland. I was going to Hamilton. I was going to Oshawa. I was doing everything that I th thought I needed to do that my coach was telling me, the team was telling me while handling the nine to five job. And the nine to five job at this point has quickly become 14 hour plus job, right? Um, and I didn't have the courage. The honest, honest truth is I didn't have the courage to quit until I was forced to. My mind was already um, not with the company, of course. So from becoming proactive guy to a very reactive, just salary guy trying to kill time, um, it be quickly became very, very difficult to stay there. And just recently when the pandemic hit, actually before that, our, our factory had a flood. For some odd reason, it had a flood. So we couldn't go back to the office. So I was already kind of at home, like part-time. And then pandemic hit and uh, the company decided to reduce their workforce. And I was chosen as part of the person to, to be let go with a six months severance, very good severance. And I was like, wow, um, this must be my opportunity. But my reaction, my automatic reaction was, oh, God, oh man, I gotta find another job. That was my instant reaction for that week. But after a week, I don't know what happened, but I just stick to, so I have something called a KPI, Key Performance Index, that uh, I worked with Marianne, my coach. And as long as I just focused every week on the specific task that I need to get it done, business start flowing. And um, I feel good. And I was able to tell the, the world that I'm a full-time real estate investor slash realtor, right? It, it just changed everything. <laughs> I feel like just clapping right now. <laughs> Good for you. So, Holy smokes, man. What a journey. But the week after I was let go by my day job, I was also let go by the Irwin's team. So we had a conflict um, for various reasons that it just didn't work out. So things happened back to back. Company let go. I think I, I quit coaching. And I was next thing I find out, I'm no longer with the wow. team. And Charles, we had no I'm, idea you were going through all this. Holy smokes. <laughs> so, but you didn't the, leave Rockstar. No. Yeah, that's that. We had no idea. Nick, you had no idea, did you? That, I, I didn't know. When you, well, I remember when you transitioned full time. It was early during uh, when the pandemic hit pandemic, because yeah. he, Charles asked, he's like, hey, can I come into the office and work? And the office was pretty, it was almost a ghost, ghost town, town, right? So I'm like, well, yeah, it's, it's tons of room. It's no problem. So you would yeah. come in and to your credit, you put your head down and you came and you sat down regularly every day. And I guess you had some, a new version of if, if the coaching was quit or the old version of your KPIs and you just kind of stuck with things and to build momentum yeah to, your credit, to build yeah. momentum and you were getting there was a little bit of frustration i think too because the momentum is a tough thing to build like oh, Tom said. so early on there just wasn't something's happening and and you were like hey when does this kind of start and i'm like look man and i remember talking to you in the kitchen i'm like i wish i had a magic answer for you i can tell you though that it's it's just it's the toughest thing to get going and you just got to stick with it because you were doing some of the right stuff right and then things started clicking though right i guess around last summer things started kind of clicking for you yes um it was very lonely as well because I had nobody to talk to and my wife, oh, by, by the way, my, my wife is new to the country. So it's, there's not much conversation happen within the house that I can bounce off ideas with. And where is she from? She's from Taiwan. And, yeah. um, how long have you been married? Two years. Yeah. yeah awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if anybody listening to this think, you know, um, there's a magic way or a, a to Z process of how to quit your job and start real estate full time. Um, no matter how much I planned, it didn't work out that way. But life has a way of pushing you through your uncomfortable zones. And as long as you, you work at what you need to do, it just, it just happens. <laughs> what does your mother think right now? <laughs> She's still watching me. She's talking uh, about investing with her the people from the music school. Yeah, so, she, she, yeah, wants, yeah, she yeah. wants to buy. She wants yeah, to buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and your brother is uh, in 
British Columbia somewhere, maybe? No, no? My, my brother is here, too. He, okay. he recently graduated. He works in, uh, he's a biochemical degree person. Oh, yeah, it sounds like an easy degree. Another easy yeah. degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no just problem. knock off these easy yeah, degrees. Yeah, yeah. It's not as hard as my psychology degree, just for context. But yeah, that, I can see how that could be rather difficult. <laughs> yeah, but my, my brother has a polar opposite personality than me. He is almost, he's very, very introvert. And he doesn't really talk to people. He has a hard time talking to others. Um, and he's not very driven. He's comfortable where he is. So I've always which felt is like... Fi- which is fine too, right? Well, it's I mean, the world needs people like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like if he's got a biochem and he's doing something in that field, yeah. w- the world needs people like that that can buckle down and, and do that type of research and that type of work too, you know? So there's 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 a value to that for sure. Yeah. My, my goal this year or... If it doesn't work out this year, then me- next year, I want to bring my brother into the rock star community because I think there's a lot of value here that he can use. Even if it's one word from an investor or one f- word from you guys, it could click and it could ignite his uh, his ambition. You know, at the beginning <laughs> when you were talking about how in Japan there's a certain social culture where your confidence is, you, you, it, it's, it's difficult to have maybe an independent confidence just because of the way the social fabric is in Japan. Some of the things we try to share at Rockstar, I don't know if you've resonated with them or heard them, is about your own personal development and what you can do and building momentum, building your own confidence. You can you can do anything that you put your mind to. Were these brand new concepts for you to hear? Yes, but it, it felt like these were words that I wanted to put in words, but I couldn't before. And somehow it came out of your mouth but it was in my subconscious mind, you know? So everything that you said, it resonates so much. And uh, I feel like if this is not the place I want to be, then I don't know where it is because in this office, in this community, I have everything it takes for me to succeed and break out of the middle class. Wow. I, we, it's astonishing to me that we really had no idea the depth and detail of your, your journey. Holy yeah. smokes. Sometimes we're head down in our own yeah. and we don't, yeah. you know, yeah. we don't, don't put, bring our heads up to kind of realize some of the stuff. That's really cool. Thank you. Charles, there's yeah. going to be challenges for you ahead, right? It's life. Yeah. But just, oh gosh, just yeah. know you're developing a network of people around you here and beyond here that will support you through this whole yeah. thing. So but you have friends. You need something. Thank you. Reach out. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And the base of skills that you're developing for yourself, you, it just makes all the circumstances that come up next to when they come up again easier and easier to handle right you just become a more resourceful person over time and you got to deal with more stuff so all i knew about your story that one day was that you were born in china no i think we had somebody who wanted (laughs) someone here to speak mandarin and i was like charles do you speak mandarin and i was confused because for some reason i think i knew you were born in china or i for but then you didn't speak mandarin you're like no i grew up in japan so the whole thing was just confusing to me and that was the impetus for this podcast we're like okay there's some kind of story here that we need to get out but i didn't know we were going to get all this so uh, very cool. So where where do you go from here, Charles? So um, I've helped out with uh, several investors throughout the years already. Um, it will be kind of cool to see their first two hundred thousand in profit. That's kind of where, what I'm waiting for for the first milestone because hundred thousand they already passed. Um, yeah, so two hundred thousand will be a cool milestone to hit. Then after that, if I could help out more investors. Oh, by the way, guys. I just moved to Hamilton, so that was a big move. We moved last week from Toronto downtown, and uh, it's a bungalow. We're gonna duplex it. We're gonna house hack. So, where is what is that happening to Canada? We have someone <laughs> born in China, grew yeah. up in Japan, it all lands, my life. Lands in British Columbia, comes to Toronto, and now lives in Hamilton, Hamilton. Ontario. <laughs> Holy smokes! Well, yeah, Hamilton I'm, is lucky to have you, man. I've only lived in the city all my life, big cities, but. Uh, we're, we're loving it so far. And I think the fact that I'm able to act more quickly, it will help the investor that I'm helping with. Mm-hmm. I'm more accessible. If they, something happens to the property or they want to see something quickly or they want to do a virtual tour, um, Hamilton, Brantford, Wellings, and Castling, I'm, I'm just more accessible. You're, you're, there. you're, there. you're in the middle I'm of there. The so you're regular it's there. My yeah. Back, yeah. So I think that will help with the business more. Uh, it was a big move that we did. Cool. And wow. also adding this to our portfolio as well right once we move out what area of hamilton uh it's on the west cliff yeah cool 
very nice. Yeah, awesome, man. <laughs> very quiet and nice. So, uh, Charles, where there's more. You know what? I, I didn't realize we were going to uh, get into all this good stuff because I haven't had a chance to talk to you about Bitcoin even. And not just that, your real estate properties that you prefer and don't prefer. Is there anything around the real estate properties that you like and don't like that yes. you'd like to? Yeah, can you can you share that? I own one property. It's nearby the lake in the Hamilton West Harbor area. It's a very nice area for the future development, but the property itself is like eighteen something hundred. Very very old. The foundation itself is like a rock. Foundation. We know because we own one. We like have that. one. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And the exterior of the house is sided, and it's a semi, okay? Um, what happened was that we had an animal incident. So from both of the tenants got called, hey, Charles, we hear some child up in the roof in the middle of the night. I'm like, what do you mean? There must be a child in the, up in the roof. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, could, could, it be, could it be like an animal or something? So we called the professionals. Um, they told me first, no, 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 it's going to be just a small mice. So we set up the, the traps all around. It wasn't a mice. Uh, it's a little bit bigger. So next thing they told me, uh, it's going to be a rat. It's not as small as mice, but it's, it's a little bit bigger. So it must be a rat. So we set up more traps, and it wasn't. And the week after, they told me it was a squirrel. <laughs> it must be the squirrel going through the, the roof vents. Mm -hmm into the, the roof. And we have this uh, vaulted roof, so we don't really have access into the roof because it's all being exposed. Um, and we have no way of getting in. So you have to tear down the roof. Or Tom's been fighting with squirrels around his <laughs> house for a long yeah. time. Did you put the, the metal case? Oh yeah, we've done, <laughs> yeah, we've done everything, but I don't think we've gauge. done what you're gonna do. Yeah. yeah. And Was then this the a shotgun? <laughs> <laughs> and the week after that, we've been told uh, it's, it's, a bear. it's none of this. It's not bear, but somehow it's animals going in through the deck up to the roof and there must be a partition wall between the two semis yeah, with a that cavity. there's a gap a cavity that they're getting through oh, so we set up the animal trap guess what we find a possum oh, oh gosh until that have time, you seen a possum i've Those never are seen ugly animals man nick have you seen a possum? Yeah, oh i've God. never seen a possum in my life and what scared me was possum usually carry around their their your family or their children so they're like okay what if they're having new babies in there <laughs> that instantly gave me like chills i'm like oh you guys do whatever you need to do get, yeah, get them, them out there yeah. so we caught the possum and the noise is still there <laughs> so we go back again we set up the traps next week it was a raccoon okay <laughs> Wait, now no, there was a part there's an animal party animal there. party okay. down there <laughs> Was that the end? So, yes, this was the end. Um, we had to do a lot of work ourselves to do the, uh, we, we did like a metal framing around the deck just to close everything mm -hmm. and to get all the animals out. Uh, but, but yeah, it worked out in the end with the help of our tenants and, of, of course, the, uh, the professionals who help us get the animal out. But if you're a first-time investor, I would say be careful with uh, older properties. Anything older than like... 1900 well you have to be careful <laughs> uh foundation right, so you're developing a specialty of, of houses built yeah. in the 1800s yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sided homes make sure you get an inspection i didn't get an inspection for that home we got a deal but um we should have done an inspection afterwards and then most of the stuff you're helping people with is in the areas that you just mentioned are yeah, you doing hamilton yeah. yeah are you doing downtown toronto stuff as well right now just for friends and family, but for now, I'm going to focus on the West. Okay, and, and your focus on the West is single-family, semi-detached, townhome, and, and maybe condos as well? Is it all property types? Yeah, and uh, mainly bungalows that you can suite or okay, so add a garden suite. So yeah. adding a, so a bungalow that you can add a legal garden suite or a yep. second suite in it to increase the income on it. That would be my yeah number one strategy for now. Okay, and then Charles, I don't think we've, we haven't done podcasts in a while here because of some of our summer vacations. But I think uh, somebody on our team is actually Mike, who's sitting right over there, was just did, filled a, or an in rock star m investor just filled a second suite in Hamilton at nice. 2,600 upstairs, 2,200 wow. basement. Is that inclusive of the old it's not, I believe it's... I think it was plus hydro. Yeah, it yeah, might have been hydro? plus hydro. Plus one thing. I, th yeah. I think it was plus hydro, though. But yeah. still, those yeah. are numbers we had never heard of. <laughs> yes. Yeah, recently I did one, 2,200 upper and then 1,650 in the basement. 
plus everything, mm -hmm. plus all the utilities. So and what was the per what was the purchase price on that property? So at that time we bought for six sixty, um, but it already had a second kitchen, two bedroom in the basement, mostly done. We just have to legalize it and put up the separation wall. So six sixty and about four thousand, just under that four was, thousand bucks in rent. That was your yeah, yeah, six sixty something like that. So if someone wants to find you and track you down, Charles, to <laughs> work with you, talk with you, what's the, is there an email you can hand out, a yeah. phone number? What's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, you can go to uh, charlie.com, so C-H-A-R-L-L-I.com, or charles at rockstarbrokerage.com. Or you can find me, Charles Lee, at uh, Instagram or Facebook. Okay, and the, the URL, spell it out one more time. C-H-A-R-L-L-I, Charlie. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Charles, thanks so much for sharing this. I Thank really didn't so expect all this. So, uh, and, and listen, I think we're grateful to have you as part of the Rockstar team and someone with your mentality and your drive and the way you think about life to have you part of this team is special for us. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, Your Life, Your Terms. <laughs>